Can you still see my screen? Yep, we can. Yes, we can see. Yeah. You. Okay, great. Thank you. So this is the introduction to embedded systems. Um, in the textbook and at many places in, in this lectures, we uh, use cyber physical systems. Um, we'll see the difference and, um, you know, um, they do not differ that much. Um, I think it's just the terminology. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, talk about these. Uh, as we move along the slide. Uh, we'll talk about embedded system and cyber physical systems. And these um, contents are based uh, on chapter one in the textbook. And at the end of this uh, lecture, I will talk a little bit more about how we prepare for the labs. I want to acknowledge uh, the authors of the book uh, they provide many of the slides. Okay, so focus on cyber physical systems. Um, as you see on the slide, um, those are the you know applications or uh, environment where you can see a lot of um, the systems that um, sense any. Um, the any of these surrounding environment and make decisions um, on either um, control um, certain actuators or motors uh, or devices. And for example, the uh, automotive uh, example, the cars, uh, you, if you think that you, you are having a you know, thousands or millions of uh, components in your cars that are controlled by uh, electronic systems. And there are a lot of sensors uh, in your cars, uh, especially the nicer cars. You may have a temperature sensor, uh, you may have your you know, lane departure uh, sensor. Those are the things that um, you can f uh, expect in, in cars. Um, and you expect that you have uh, electronics systems to uh, record these sensors, provide you the information, and that you uh, make decisions of you know, how you should drive the car, or even the, the car itself to um, you know, manipulate uh, the car's movement. Um, other situations, for example, manufacturing, uh, as you can see this uh, three, to robotic arm trying to, you know, do something with the body of a new car. You can expect this kind of uh, machines and mechanics and uh, electronic systems in a modern car uh, manufacturing, a factory. Um, other applications, uh, uh, avionics, uh, airplanes. Uh, it has a very complex um, control and sensing system. Um, also in biomedical fields, uh, military, or even the, uh, the modern buildings, you can expect to see a lot of these um, components or systems that belong to either physical um, aspect or cyber aspect. Um, we we'll say this cyber plus physical is because um, you have the physical systems way before the cyber. Right? You can you can have a paper airplane flying uh, without any electronics control. Uh, but when you get to more complex, more uh, sophisticated systems, oftentimes it's not physical itself. It's not cyber itself. It's a combination of both. And the idea is to, um, to use cyber uh, systems uh, to interact with physical environments, physical dynamics. So there's a computation uh, perspective and a dynamics perspective. 
And the dynamics could be uh, continuous dynamics or could be uh, discrete dynamics. So like the robotic arm in this uh, picture, it moves continuously. But for buildings, the dynamics could be, you know, flip uh, the switch on or off to states. And in these different application domains, there are different requirements on the security safety of these systems, um, and which required us to design the system by uh, considering different requirements, um, different capabilities. There are contradictions in the design of the such systems. There's often the adaptability versus repeatability. So we would like a system to be able to repeat. For example, we want to build this car using the same procedure. So these robotic arms will perform the same um, procedures, uh, sequences for, you know, car one, car two, and car 100. But still we want be able, we want the system to um, be able to change to uh, building a new car. So it's a, um, a uh, sedan versus a uh, SUV. And we want to change the robotic arms sequence uh, differently based on what cars, what kind of cars we want to build. Also for uh, connected devices to the network, we are facing the contradiction between the high connectivity and the security and privacy. So if you connect the device to the internet, you have the risk of exposing it to security threats. But if you keep it uh, isolated, then you lose the opportunity of um, scaling this further and have remote control uh, capabilities. Other uh, metrics or requirements are performance uh, versus low energy or low power. You won't have, you know, you want to have high performance computing systems, but at the same time you would like to have your laptop to run, you know, a day or even longer without uh, having to have a recharge. Asynchronous versus coordination and uh, cooperation. Uh, you want the system to be able to respond to uh, asynchronous events such as interrupts, but also when you have multiple of these, uh, you want them to work uh, in a collaborative way. For example, if you have uh, a group of uh, UAVs or unmanned uh, air area vehicles or you know, uh, drones, then you want a group of them to be able to um, communicate and perform, um, you know, uh, to accomplish a task uh, together. Scalability and reliability and predictability, those are all important, um, but sometimes you have to sacrifice maybe pr predictability or reliability in order to achieve scalability. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to get uh, every um, aspect uh, taken care of. Uh, and laws and regulations and technical possibilities, those are not always uh, on the same line. Uh, you can do this technically, but uh, from the legal perspective, uh, can you or should you do that? Uh, so that's always a question of, of, of balance. Um, economics of scale uh, versus locality. Uh, people, have, you know, some of you have heard cloud computing. Uh, maybe, you know, far computing. Those are all, you know, trying to scale, but uh, uh, when you put things in the cloud, you have less control um, over the uh, data um, sharing contents. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you keep the um, data locally, then you will have challenges of, you know, sharing this data and reach to a larger scale. 
open versus proprietary. Uh, that's obvious, uh, you know, contradictory. Um, and algorithms versus dynamics. Um, so this is really talking about the, you know, the physics part of the, the picture versus the cyber part of the picture. Um, it's, it might be easy to um, perform a uh, dynamics uh, in a physical world, but it may be a complex algorithm if you try to do that. For example, uh, if you, you know, if you move your arm, uh, just emulate this uh, movement of the robotic arm, you can do that. Um, not, well, not on the cars, but you can move your arm uh, very flexibly. But if you want to control a robotic arm, just to mimic the uh, movement of your arm, and that's not an easy thing. Um, you have to consider you know, the uh, actuators uh, at different um, you know, part of the arm and have them um, move at different speed and different angles. So from algorithms point of view, that's a very complex um, process. So the point is that if you want to have these um, innovations and uh, important um, applications in these different fields, um, the design of such cyber physical system requires new engineering methods and models to address these contradictions. Okay, uh, here we have a nice picture. Um, do, do you know this uh, E plurimbus unum? This is actually, you know, I, I didn't know until, uh, you know, very recently, this is actually the, the model um, of the seal of, of the United States. And if you look at the, the coins that you have uh, with you, you'll find such words. This is the, in Latin. Um, it means out of many, one. Um, they had this uh, in the um, early days in the United States, um, just because the United States is um, made of you know, multiple states. Now you have one uh, union. Uh, so that's one out of these many. Uh, what we want to say here is that you probably heard a lot of these different terminologies, Internet of Things, uh, Industry 4.0, um, trillion sensors, machine to machine, the fog, all these um, terminologies. And they actually are the foundations of this cyber physical system. A cyber physical system may not have everything, but uh, it's fair to say that uh, every piece of these um, technologies, the advancement of technologies uh, has made uh, the cyber physical system possible. So talking about the very popular term, Internet of Things, um, there were a lot of hypes around Internet of Things, um, good and bad. Uh, the idea of Internet of Things is to use internet technology to connect physical devices or things. You may have you know, billions, trillions of things that are being built and connected. Um, it uh, you know, follows, uh, you know, a, a, a curve that experienced by many different other technologies. Um, so it goes from the innovation as a start and then it ramps up uh, people's expectations. And then it, when it gets to uh, application stage, it may go down a little bit because people see a lot of challenges and then eventually overcame the challenges and then uh, as a result, that technology will become ubiquitous. So this kind of curve is expected uh, for many of these uh, technologies that are marked here. For example, uh, quantum computing, uh, that's very hot. Um, so, uh, I will not be surprised that uh, in five years, uh, quantum computing will be uh, one of the uh, courses in the curriculum uh, here, maybe as a required course, uh, maybe as a tech collective. Um, but the uh, other terminologies or technologies, uh, for example, 
data science, you've heard of that a lot. Um, uh, um, let's see, smart robots, um, you know, connect the home or smart home, big data, all these. Um, so Internet of Things is also going through this kind of uh, hype. Um, there's peak of inflated uh, in expectations uh, and uh, eventually it will you know, go through uh, this curve by overcoming the challenges and becoming a um, ubiquitous um, technology. Um, so that's what we, uh, you know, see what's going to happen for Internet of Things. But coming back to the cyber physical system, um, is IoT the same as cyber physical system? Um, we say that IoT is the use of internet technology for cyber physical system. Um, we've seen a lot of these networking technology used in cyber physical system, even early days in 2008, as you see in the picture shown here. Um, Bosch, uh, this company has this printing press. Uh, it's a cyber physical factory. Uh, the reason we say that is uh, all these machines, these print machines, um, they are connected uh, in a way that using Ethernet and TCP IP. So those are the network protocols that you, you probably heard. And using these networking technologies, they can provide high precision clock synchronization for these individual machines on an isolated LAN. So, you know, strictly speaking, speaking, this isolated LAN is not connected to the internet. But, you know, if we look into this uh, system, it has networking technology locally to connect uh, these individual machines. Um, IoT term uh, includes the solution of internet technology in problems statement connected things. Um, but um, the, the term cyber physical system does not really uh, emphasize or require this internet technology. What we mean by that is uh, cyber physical system here, we emphasize the uh, interaction between the cyber system and the physical systems. Uh, it may connect it to internet, it may not connect to internet. Uh, for example, um, you have a car. So the car is a typical cyber physical systems because you, you know, control all the, um, um, you know, either using steering wheel or using your, um, the dashboard uh, to control the functions of your car, um, moving, you know, forward or backward or, you know, acceler accelerate or deaccelerate, uh, you know, turn left, or turn right. Um, this is a typical cyber physical system. But does it have to be connected to internet? Um, well, in the future, maybe every car will be connected to internet, but now um, they are not connected to internet in most of the cases. So um, what we wanna say here is that uh, IoT uh, does not equal to cyber physical systems. Whereas in our class, we we will talk about mainly on the cyber physical systems, um, specifically how we uh, model the physical system and how we model the cyber part of it and how we design um, the system to implement the design goals and the ways to analyze the design. Um, we have this you know, design and it may or may not use internet technology so it may or may not be a IOT, but still uh, it's a cyber physical system. Now the book used cyber physical system exclusively uh, for describing these um, systems that uh, integrate uh, or interact um, tightly with um, electronics and physical procedures. Um, you can think about these are the embedded systems that we're talking about. Uh, these systems are, uh, this is actually the control part is typically small and their functionalities are typically dedicated 
um, you know, for example, the robotic arm, it's you know, built, for, built for robotic arm. Uh, it's different from these laptops and um, uh, HPC servers, uh, which can be used for general purpose computing. Where in our case, the systems we're gonna study and design are uh, small um, dedicated functions um, have stringent design requirements. Okay, so here is an example. Um, it's the flying pa uh, pasture example. Uh, flying pasture is a machine uh, that's being used for uh, high speed, uh, high volume printing. Um, if you're interested, you can click this link to go look at uh, the explanation of the flying pastures. Essentially, you, you will show you a video uh, after this one, but you, what you are seeing here is really a, a machinery in a printing house. Um, it's totally different from your personal printers, which takes those uh, you know, letter size or A4 size uh, stack of paper sheets. The printing house that we're looking at here is um, using these large machines and the paper that they want to print on is not uh, supplied as individual sheets. Instead, they are supplied using these large rolls, um, very thick, large rolls you will see. And the rolls will be, you know, unroll and the paper will be supplied through uh, a serial series of steps, either roller, dancer to move, you know, the, the pages, uh, sorry, not the page, the, the paper through this drive roller and eventually fit into the, the printers. Um, but these rolls may be used up. Um, you know, then you have to uh, replace the paper. Now, we're talking about big printing house. So they are expect, uh, expecting these machines to print books or magazines um, continuously. So any interruption about this machine will be costly. So the goal here is to um, kind of um, supply an endless uh, row of papers to these printing machines or at least try to um, supply a new role before the old role is going to be uh, completed. And that's the machinery we're gonna be seeing in the next video where um, these um, system is trying to um, have very precise positioning and also turning these roles at a specific speed so that the new role of paper can be uh, spliced or well, you know, kind of stitch it to the existing row and continuously feeding these big printing machines. Um, so let me show you the, um, sorry, I don't know if you can hear. Um, um, this is, you know, in the factory, so it's kind of noisy, um, but this is the, the new um, row they want to feed in. So this is the old role. Now the old role, um, you know, is spliced with the new role, which then uh, continuously supply these, uh, you know, long sheets of paper into these printing machines. Um, this video is actually available on this website. Um, I think what we show here is just a shorter version of it. Uh, you can see the complete one uh, on this website. So as you can see, this is a big machine. Obviously, this is a very complex physics process, physical dynamics. We have uh, large rolls uh, rotating, and also we need to have these big, um, you know, um, flying arms to rotate the uh, other roll and trying to splice these two rolls, and then at the right moment perform this cut, so this new roll can continue supplying the paper sheets. Um, you, as you can expect, the control of the system uh, is uh, very dedicated. Uh, you don't have to have a laptop to do this. 
but you have to be very precise in terms of moving these two roles and um, perform the right, um, um, you know, press the, you know, the right amount of force and cut the, um, the sheets uh, at the right moment so they can be spliced uh, together and coming con continuously from the new roll. Uh, okay, I just want to check here. Can you still hear me? All right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank yes. You. All right. Before I, you know, show you this next one, um, just want to warn you that uh, it's a little bit disturbing um, because uh, we're showing some problems here. This is a typical off ramp of a highway and uh, a typical day, but uh, something happened. So the 18 wheeler suddenly made a unexpected turn towards the you know, center of the highway and just fly over that, uh, you know, um, defense and then uh, cause a chain of um, actions and of course accidents. And um, I will be surprised if there are no people injured or, or even dead. Um, but this is a very challenging problem for cyber physical systems um, in that how would you design a system to prevent such uh, horrible things happening from happening and uh, there are a lot of things we can do to at least reduce such risk um, and um, that's you know that's a good example um, well that's an example that can show us the importance of a um, properly designed uh, cyber physical system and also shows the uh, consequences if um, the design is not successful or not reliable. All right, um, this is a fun picture to show. Um, so we have an elephant and um, of course we have quite a few people trying to examine what is an elephant. Uh, depends on where the person sits or stands um, or looking at, uh, they have a totally different response. And because they don't see the big picture, they only see, well, they only feel a, a part of it and different parts of it. So it's challenging to work in this multidisciplinary area as this uh, CPS design. So in the CPS design, you may see that this is a uh, small computer if you only look at the computation part of this design. Or you can say, oh, this is a networking issue if you are only concerned about how this device connects to internet. Um, you may think about, oh, this is a, you know, a robot. Uh, well, you are, you are right in some uh, regard, but uh, what's in a robot and what's the purpose of it. And um, also you may think about this as the uh, an advanced manufacturing. Well, yes, that's a possible um, application domain, but what entails the requirements and uh, what will be the you know, cost and, and, and uh, other constraints, uh, that's something we have to put into uh, the design process. Okay, again, using car as example, uh, those uh, automotive uh, CPS uh, has far greater impact than probably many other fields um, because cars that, you know, with people every day, uh, it's important to have safer transportation. And also from the environment perspective, we would like to reduce emissions. Um, you know, I. 
I think these several weeks I saw a lot of you know uh, commercials from Amazon uh, who is trying to uh, do this uh, environmental um, um, you know um, protection uh, initiative trying to um, supply the um, uh, battery powered vehicles for delivering uh, Amazon packages. Also for smart transportation, uh, we would like to have cars to be able to interact with each other. And also uh, we would like to have cars to interact with the, the roads. So in a smart transportation system, uh, we will have to uh, think about how we uh, can sense the environment, uh, not necessarily, not only the, uh, the car itself, but also the surrounding environment and the, the other cars. And when we uh, move into battery, uh, um, you know, uh, vehicles, battery power vehicles, we ha would have to talk about uh, energy efficiency uh, so that we can, you know, uh, reduce the impact uh, to the environment and uh, also um, alleviate, alleviate the uh, impact to climate change. And when you have human in cars, uh, if you look, look at this car as a robot, um, then this human robot or human machine collaboration or interaction is also a, a important aspects um, when we design such a you know futuristic uh, automotive um, you know, autonomous uh, vehicle uh, and for the smart and safer transportation the other example uh, is also uh, from cars so uh, as people designing cars and especially uh, designing high efficiency engines we're talking about still the uh, fuel engines. Uh, it's important to control the air fuel ratio so that we can reach the uh, optimal optimal state for the purpose of reducing emissions. Uh, the engine has this catalytic uh, converters uh, that can reduce CH4 carbon dioxide and oxide emissions. And the conversion efficiency um, can reach op optimal at this uh, stoic geometric value. So there is a narrow window for the uh, air fuel ratio uh, in order to achieve this optimal uh, efficiency level. Now, how do we achieve that then? Um, so in the gas engine setting, uh, we will have something like this. Uh, we have this engine here, and we have the fuel injectors will inject fuel uh, into the engine so that they can um, um, burn and uh, um, you know, uh, perform these uh, chemical reactions and then uh, move the uh, pistons of the engine. So in order to achieve this uh, perfect or optimal air fuel ratio, we need to have uh, these sensors at different places. So in this diagram, this way, this is the uh, air uh, incoming um, path or the intake uh, manifold. And on the other hand, this is the exhaust manifold. So this is how, uh, where the uh, smoke will be emitted to the environment. So we will uh, ideally have these sensors at these two places, which will measure the uh, air flow, also measure the uh, air fuel ratio from the um, you know, uh, exhaust. And these sensors will provide uh, vital information for the control system to determine how the fuel injectors should be open or closed. Uh, and so that we can achieve this uh, optimal air fuel ratio. So in this system, we have uh, uh, sensors. We have actuators, which are the things we control. Um, and also we have uh, the um, cyber physical system, the computing part, which is not illustrated in this diagram. So um, 
this is a good example that shows that uh, we will have these um, very important components in a typical cyber physical system, sensing, control, and actuation. Um, you know, many of these cyber physical systems have to have this in order to uh, have a um, system to interact with the environment, with, with the machinery uh, for, uh, for this particular application. Uh, well, the software here is uh, going to be important as part of the um, embedded system uh, for the computation. All right, so this is a um, diagram that illustrates some of the disruptive technologies as pointed out uh, in about seven years ago by uh, McKenzie Global Institute. So they did a lot of research to find out, okay, what are the um, you know, far impact uh, technologies that will provide uh, profound uh, benefits to society? For example, mobile internet. So that's where you can um, um, you know, access a browser or uh, emails um, on your cell phone. And here, Internet of Things, cloud, uh, and advanced robotics, uh, and advanced oil and gas, and 3D printing, and advanced materials, you know, all these. And even this list is um, given seven years ago, you can see these are still very um, hot terminologies. Uh, or, you know, still people are trying very hard to achieve, uh, to advance um, in these technologies. Out of this list, we can see that many of them have major CPS components. The things that's uh, not highlighted here are uh, the automation of knowledge work, cloud technology, advanced materials, uh, and next generation genomics. Those are probably more on the you know uh, high performance computation side, you know. Um, neural networks, uh, machine learning. Uh, but the other ones that are highlighted here, they all have major CPS components with them. For example, mobile internet, uh, your cell phones uh, have a lot of sensors uh, and they are connected to internet and uh, it, they have uh, those computing resources to perform these controls and then uh, to provide information to you. And uh, advanced, advanced robotics, of course, you know, as we see in the very first diagram uh, slide, uh, in that robotic arm, you have uh, you know, a lot of the um, capabilities of um, doing sensing, um, uh, do uh, flexible uh, controlling, and also intelligence to automate the tasks. The potential, uh, uh, the economic potential also uh, is significant. Uh, for the Internet of Things, uh, we expect a 3,000% increase in connected machine-to-machine uh, -machine devices. Um, um, we have about one trillion things that are connected to the Internet. The operating cost uh, of uh, the affected industry will be 36 trillion. Uh, I won't repeat these you know, numbers uh, on the slide, but as you can see, all these um, areas uh, or technologies um, that involve CPS have huge uh, economic potential and impact. Um, that is good news for us um, as a computer engineering or uh, electrical engineering or other majors. Um, engineering majors, we have a lot of, you know, a room to explore, uh, to investigate, and uh, to study and to advance to um, improve these technologies and um, achieve the, um, you know, better uh, performance metrics and better goals. The next two slides are about several um, 
companies and uh, how they invest in CPS design and systems. Uh, Google um, uh, acquired a company called Nest about six years ago. Um, at that time, Nest is a company with just one product. That's the learning thermostat. Thermostat has been with us for a long time, probably you know, maybe a hundred years, a while guess. Um, but um, until um, Nest, um, people have been using thermostat uh, in a very um, rudimentary way. Um, it can measure the temperature, of course, um, but uh, you know, it does really not much more than that. Nest was the company that um, connect these thermostats uh, by re-engineering it, by redesigning it into a cyber physical system. So it still measures the temperature, uh, but these temperature data uh, can be sent to uh, the cloud uh, because this Nest sensor uh, have this uh, networking capability. And that's a game changer. Because once you have these thermostats and you know, millions or billions of these data samples collected, you can do a lot of learning and analysis on these data to make smart decisions on whether um, to uh, control the uh, you know, AC or uh, furnace uh, or heating system um, you know, to reduce energy consumption, uh, to reduce your, your cost. I think that's the, the reason that you know, Google see this as a, a very significant uh, change uh, to a traditional physical uh, device um, to a um, intelligent cyber physical system. Similarly, uh, robotic car uh, from Google uh, you know, has a lot of sensors uh, built onto the car. Um, also, it has um, the computation capability to generate a 3D map of its environment, uh, and then you know, takes the uh, generated map and combine them into high re resolution uh, maps of the world. The other example is this solar powered drone. Um, this is a uh, artistic rendering of Titan's uh, Solara 50, uh, which in theory can stay aloft for years. And this company has been acquired by Facebook, I think. Um, well, by Google. Um, and um, the um, purpose of this drone is to provide uh, uninterrupted network connectivity to remote areas using this uh, uh, autonomous solar power drone, which can you know, fly for weeks and months. Um, Okay, Tesla uh, has you know done many um, you know groundbreaking um, things recently. Um, the um, what's the space mission? Uh, have you seen that uh, the whole story in the summer? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's the name of the vehicle? Um, this Dragon. Dragon, yes. Yeah. Dragon is one of the things that Tesla uh, team have, you know, done magnificent, magnificent job by sending uh, astronauts to the International Space Station using a commercial vehicle. In the past, uh, it only NASA did that, and now uh, Tesla is changing that, uh, the whole picture, uh, to make it more cost effective because the, the vehicle, Dragon, can uh, be reused. So what we see here is a different thing uh, done by Tesla. Uh, this is the Giga factory. Uh, this is the picture. Um, well, it's not the actual picture. It's the artistic rendering 
uh, of the battery factory um, being constructed in Nevada. I think the project started a couple of years ago. Uh, Tesla had this huge plan of, you know, have this gigafactory. And um, several in important things and interesting things about this factory. This is a factory that will manufacture batteries and the engine pack, battery engine pack for Tesla cars. Um, and this is a huge, huge factory. And um, it, it will consume a lot of power when it runs. Um, the good news is that the power to drive, to, to, the, to run this factory is all coming from itself or nearby wind turbines. So on the top, on the roof, all these uh, solar panels, uh, they can generate a lot of power. And the nearby uh, wind farms, um, so those are the um, wind turbines that will generate power uh, in megawatts um, to drive this factory. Um, not surprisingly, there will be a lot of cyber physical systems. Um, even each of these turbines is a complex cyber physical system because the, um, the wind turbine have to turn and, uh, and, and you have to have sensors to sense the speed, detect any damages, uh, and also to, sh to uh, start or shut down the generator uh, if necessary uh, and for maintenance and for other purposes and also to maintain speed and to schedule power delivery. So all these things have to be um, done in the electronic system uh, uh, with in tight inter interaction with the physical systems. Okay, Apple Car, iCar is still a mystery. Um, there are a lot of rumors Apple have been designing some kind of iCar um, in-house. Um, but we still, you know, don't hear any official news. Maybe we'll hear that soon. Uh, but this is a um, one of the um, autonomous car um, um, practices or plans uh, in the world. Uh, I think all the new car manufacturers are talking some kind of electric um, autonomous car, uh, you know, that will be available in the near future. So if we look into this uh, cyber world, um, we see the, um, in the core, uh, we call it infrastructure core, we have a lot of the big machines, big routers, uh, server farms, um, data centers, cloud environment. And um, further away, we see this mobile access uh, devices, uh, laptops, um, smartphones, uh, Game Boy consoles, um, music players, all these. And many of these are connected to the internet. Um, and then uh, even at larger scale uh, in terms of quantity and the area that uh, these deployed, you can see these um, sensor swarms or you know, billions of sensors uh, for temperature, for um, um, stress, for, uh, you know, motion, um, for chemical processes, uh, for visual sensing. Um, so all these are, um, you know, layered structures of this uh, emerging IT world. All right, so I spent a lot of time motivating, you know, about cyber physical systems and why they're important, what they are, and, uh, you know, any design requirements, uh, examples. So back to this course, um, we would like to use this course to introduce a, a principled scientific approach to design 
and implement embedded systems. Um, we can take a, let's say, Arduino development kit. We can go ahead, putting things together, um, make something that uh, can function. But in order to uh, really understand the engineering design process and have this principled scientific approach, uh, we need to go beyond just hacking with embedded systems. Um, hacking can be fun, but uh, if things go wrong, you have to spend a lot of time to uh, ask yourself uh, why this is not working um, and how we should you know, resolve this problem. And because it can be very painful when things go wrong, so we need to really step back and then think at higher level to understand um, how we should design a system. In fact, we should start by using uh, some models to uh, capture or to estimate uh, what kind of design we will have. So we'll focus on both model-based system design. But on the other hand, when we um, get hands-on and we, we have to present this deliverable, we cannot avoid the hacking part of it. Um, we will have to do this embedded system hardware and software design. So that's why the other piece of this course is really the design aspect. The, in order to introduce the principled scientific approach to designing and implementing embedded systems, we will go through this model uh, analysis and verification steps. Um, we will try to capture the, uh, or try to capture the, you know, essence of the system, the goals using some models, and then we will, you know, um, analyze it and uh, verify at different stages. We will go through a journey of these hands-on experiments, especially uh, using these lab assignments. We will look into the system architecture of the designs. Uh, we will understand, try to understand the, um, the actual tools we use to design hardware and software and the methodologies for debug and optimization. We'll focus on both model-based system design and embedded system implementation. But in this process, we will try to apply theoretical results uh, and methods in the real applications. So you can expect that in the lectures, we will um, cover the, many of these important concepts uh, in modeling these cyber physical systems uh, the methods to analyze them with some examples. Also in the lectures, and especially in the lab assignments, we will use these uh, concrete uh, lab assignments to uh, give you a chance to uh, practice this method. Let's talk about modeling design and analysis, three uh, integral part of this designing process. Modeling is the process of gaining a deeper understanding of the system through imitation. So we may not have to um, drill down to individual processors or you know, memory chips or uh, IO uh, components we'll have to put together, we'll have to buy. In the modeling phase, we don't really care about that. We just want to use the models to express what a system does or should do. So you outline the functionalities and oftentimes you also specify the performance metrics. For example, if you design a uh, digital camera, uh, you want to say that I want to have a um, feature on this digital camera that is taking continuous Picture, pictures. So you can say, I want, you know, enable the users to do this. If the user press the button and hold the button, the shutter button, 
until the button is released. So this is a good example of you know, what kind of functionality uh, you want to have in this design. And also uh, for this particular function or feature, you want to design certain performance metrics. For example, I want to achieve you know, conti continuous you know, taking pictures, you know, um, 20 pictures per second versus maybe you know, five pictures per second. Those are important design goals metrics, which can be part of the modeling. Um, when we get to the design phase, uh, the design itself is a structured creation of artifacts. So at the design phase, uh, we will need to um, specify how a system does what it does. This includes both the hardware and software perspective. We need to, at this stage, pick the right processors, right memory components, uh, right um, you know, interconnection buses, uh, peripherals, uh, you know, power uh, supply unit. And also we need to um, connect them if they are hardware and also um, design and um, implement uh, software algorithms and deploy onto these hardware uh, platforms. So the design phase specifies how a system does what it does. The third phase is the analysis. Analysis is the process of gaining deeper understanding of the system through the section. It specifies why a system does what it does. Um, so once you have the design, you want to check uh, if the design meets your design goals or, or system specs. Analysis is such a step uh, because we can analyze the performance of the actual design when your team finished the design. We can then uh, find out whether the shutter speed, if you hold the button con continuously, can the, the digital camera produce 20 pictures per second at that speed. Um, so analysis can tell you whether your design works, meets the requirement or not. If not, and then we have to go back. If you see the picture on the right side in this uh, slide, you will see there are a lot of arrows pointing from one box to another box. This is really to say that these, um, these parts are overlap, overlapped and um, we need to go through this design process iteratively. Uh, maybe we need to change the model maybe we need to change the design and then do the uh, re-evaluation. So it's a very complex, sometimes um, you know, consuming, time consuming process before you can end up with a um, design that meets the performance requirements, cost requirements and all the other constraints. The textbook that we're gonna use in this course uh, is from uh, professors at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's written for uh, you know, this course, um, strive to identify and introduce the durable inter intellectual ideas of embedded systems. The book itself emphasizes uh, the three pieces that we just talked about, modeling, design, and analysis of cyber physical systems. Uh, you can download the book uh, for free uh, from this website. Check what time is it? Um, okay, I think uh, I'm gonna keep going um, without taking a break. Um, so uh, we m might be able to end the class a little bit early. 
uh, feel free if you want to you know, step away for you know a couple of minutes uh, and come back um, if you want to take a short break but I'll just keep going here all right so this is a motivating example of a cyber physical system um, in the picture here we see a drone uh, actually it's a, a quad rotor air, aircraft uh, this uh, particular aircraft is called Star Mac. Uh, it, it, it was an experimental system um, drone testing platform uh, built at Stanford. Uh, it was a, from a research project. Um, there are many challenges of uh, building this kind of uh, a, a drone or a flying um, cyber physical system. First, uh, how do we control the flight? So as you can see here, this is a, a quad rotor, so which means it has four um, you know, motors uh, at each corner. And you can control the speed um, of each rotor, which produce different thrust uh, pushing downwards. Um, you can you know, adjust uh, the um, thrust force by changing the speed of these rotors to perform different movement. For example, uh, moving forward, backward, or even flip over. So the control of such flight is uh, very complex itself. Also, the other challenge is the weight. Uh, it carries a battery, uh, you know, uh, in addition to the uh, control circuit. Uh, it may carry other load. So how do you design the system uh, so that the amount of uh, thrust produced by the rotors can uh, carry um, these uh, payload at certain speed. And because it has weight, uh, so it, it can be dangerous. So the third challenge will be, you know, how we should design it so that this uh, quad rotor aircraft can interact with the environment and maybe uh, also with the human safely and effectively. So those are you know, uh, some challenges that you can imagine when designing such a cyber physical system. In this cyber physical system, as we can see in the, in the next few slides, that there are a lot of components, uh, but uh, you know, talking about the, all these challenges, um, the right side here on the slide shows the list of these um, topics that will be covered at different chapters in this textbook. For example, flight dynamics, um, mode of operations, transition between modes, uh, sensors, actuators, processors, memory systems, interfacing, um, concurrent software, and analysis, etc. Uh, in our course this semester, we will not be able to uh, cover every single chapter, um, but I'll you know show you each week that which chapter we will uh, cover, and hopefully you can read the uh, contents in that particular chapter. Okay, so this is a diagram I was talking about. Um, this shows the uh, internals of the um, uh, quad router, uh, Star Mac. Uh, we don't have to go into very detail. What, what you can see here, there are you know, different colored boxes, basically three colors. Um, the green color boxes, those are all sensors. Uh, you can recognize some of them, uh, GPS, camera. Uh, LiDAR is a um, kind of a, a very precise distance um, sensing a method using uh, radar, short range radar. Uh, AMU, uh, this is the one we're actually gonna use in the um, second lab. In addition to these sensors, we have uh, those uh, yellow boxes. These are actually processors or computational units. And we have three different kinds. If you're curious about it, um, this RoboSticks is actually based on at Mega Chip. Uh, this is a microcontroller that we use. Uh, um, well, it's 
the same kind of microcontroller we use in our labs, but it's not exact the same model. Uh, this type of microcontrollers can uh, perform real-time control operations. So the low-level flight control is done by using this uh, microcontroller. This other two are more um, at a higher level because both of them run uh, operating systems. And this one um, is used for uh, supervision of this whole system and also uh, performing GPS localization and a communication using Wi-Fi. And this one uh, is using for uh, uh, estimation and control, running those robotic uh, control algorithms, for example, reinforcement learning uh, type of algorithms. Um, so the, those are the yellow boxes. Then we have these purple boxes. These are uh, Wi-Fi interfaces. So this is the uh, networking fabric that we'll uh, also talk about in later courses. Um, using Wi-Fi and other te network technologies, we will be able to control the system uh, from a remote point. Okay, so um, the theme of this course is to think critically and design systematically. Um, any course that purports to teach you how to design embedded system is misleading you. This is not my word. This is the word from the author of the book. I kind of agree. Uh, I think the point is that uh, you cannot just teach embedded system design by you know, handing you over a bunch of Markov processors and uh, um, other components and wires and then let you connect and uh, program it. That's only one part of it. Um, it's because the technology will change. The processor that you use today may not be available uh, the next year. And the components that you use in today's class, in the next year, you may have a new version of it. So it's important to uh, teach you how things are done today, but, and also why that's not good enough. Um, you will learn the uh, theoretical part of this course uh, and to understand the methodologies, the um, fundamentals behind uh, these different tools and um, the processors available today. And you will not be surprised by the changes uh, that are coming and sure they will come.